Uh, okay, hello. This is Game Center Live. This is our weekly streaming show here at NYU Game Center, which is a four year and two year program uh, for game design here in New York City. Uh, today, we have a really nice show for you today. Uh, we are going to talk about VR and the state of VR and look at a very recent VR release, Bizarre Barber, uh, made by one of our very own alumni and teachers, Maria. And, uh, and then we will also cap off the hour with our usual way, where we will be doing some game industry news roundups and hot takes uh, with Naomi Clark and Frank Lance. Uh, so, uh, Please hang out and stay tuned, and hopefully it will be entertaining enough. Uh, first off, let's do some quick school announcements for any students and community tuning in. Uh, so just as a reminder, um, oh gosh, captions are cut off already? OK. Uh, well, I'll have to fix that later. I'm in the middle of it, sorry. Um, uh, Playtest Thursday is running again, 5.30 to 7 p.m. Uh, at 370 J Street, 64 Lounge. Uh, this is open to students and the public. Uh, this is just a fun event where you can come hang out, get your games play tested, and uh, eat some free pizza. So please come around. Um, also, another reminder, if you want to come visit us in New York City, if you're interested in checking out our four-year BFA or two-year MFA program, or you just want to see what we're about and why you should care about us at all, if ever, uh, you should come visit us. But if you do want to come visit us, please just send us an email. Oh my god, the camera's already cut out. Jesus Christ. This is even worse than before. <laughs> uh, okay, is that back? Jesus Christ. Uh, okay. Um, uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah, don't just show up unannounced um, because then we won't have time to like help like hang out with you or anything. Uh, it's really cool if you give us a heads up before you come in, so then that way we can like give you a tour and talk to you and stuff. Uh... Uh, next up, uh, MFA students, if you are listening to this or watching this, uh, we are doing our MFA town hall next Tuesday, March 10th at 1 p.m. on the 6th floor lounge, just right behind me. Um, this is a group discussion about life on the 6th floor, uh, so please come hang out and bring your concerns, or if you can't make that town hall meeting, uh, please make sure to talk to your MFA rep uh, so that they can relay your concerns to the rest of the MFAs as well as the faculty. Uh, so again, that's next Tuesday, 1 p.m. Please come out for that. Student governance is really important to preserve the illusion or reality of democracy here at NYU. So please do that. Um, one event we're doing next uh, next week, Thursday, March 12, is we're launching a book. Uh, Jeff Engelstein is one of our faculty here. Jeff Engelstein is a tabletop genius, has designed a lot of great games, and also teaches a lot of our board game design classes. Uh, and he is launching a new book with MIT Press called Achievement Relocked. There's the cover right there. It looks kind of cool, I think so. Uh, this is a book launch slash talk Thursday, March 12th. So that's next week, 7 p.m. at 370 J Street on the second floor lecture hall. This is open to the public. If you want to hear about the book, which I think is about the psychology of game design and stuff like that, very interesting stuff. Please come out for that. Uh, I also really like book launch parties, personally, not just because I'm a professor and a nerd and stuff, but also because when you go to a book talk and a book launch, uh, the author is there and will tell you what the book is about. So if you are scared of reading books and stuff, you can just go to these book launches and then have them recite what their book is about and summarize it to you and then potentially you don't have to read the book, although you still should, and you should still totally buy the book and so on. And as a last reminder, uh, this is a last call that you need to apply to the Sloan Foundation grant. This is open to NYU game students 
who are making some kind of game or project that's just kind of vaguely related to science or technology, or if you're even just making science and technology seem interesting or cool or whatever, um, please just apply to this and you can get up to $20,000, which is really, really, really good. Uh, talk to Dylan McKenzie or Matt Parker for information on the application process and stuff for that. Um, I believe if you talk to a lot of students who've received this Sloan Foundation grant, uh, they've enjoyed the whole process and they also enjoy having a lot of money. I mean, 20,000 isn't that much compared to your student loan, but it'll help put a dent in all that stuff. Uh, so please apply to this, please get some money. <clears throat> and as usual, uh, please just visit our uh, website, please visit our Facebook, our Twitch, our Twitter, all these things are over our YouTube, all those links are over there. Um, we're on the internet, please say hello, and maybe we'll say hello back sometimes. And that's just, that's me for morning announcements. Let me turn this off and uh, let's transition to our next segment. Our next segment is we're going to talk about a very new VR game, Bizarre Barber, and we've brought in one of the main developers on it, uh, Maria Mershenko. So please come over here, Maria. And uh, let me get you mic'd up, or you can do it, I guess. Let me just turn this on. I think you should be good to go uh, on it. Um, so welcome to the show, Maria. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, first, uh, do you want to tell uh, the viewers at home and anyone in the chat um, a little bit about yourself and your background and stuff? Uh, so I had the background in filmmaking and documentaries. Uh, then I started to teach myself how to program. Then I got into the grad school here at NYU and graduated last year in May. And I'm working on the game since then and also doing some like client projects, uh, mostly about VR and AR and XR stuff, all this new technology, mm -hmm. cool and exciting. Um, yeah, it is super exciting, right? Um, when did you first hear about like VR and XR and what kind of like stirred your interest in it? So actually I uh, went to this conference called Weird Reality at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh in 2016. Oh cool, I was there too. <laughs> yeah, and then I tried Paolo's, Paolo Pedersini uh, game, The History of Gays, and that's what, that hooked me. Mm -hmm. uh, oh god, the cameras died, hold on. Yeah, and uh, this experience kind of inspired me to create my own and I've been making the VR since then. Oh cool. Oh, you have a shout out in the chat already. Uh, the person captioning our show, uh, Mirror by Night, says that uh, they captioned you talking about your game uh, at Bang Bang Con yeah, West. Yeah, yeah, this weekend, yeah, in Santa Cruz. Uh, what was ba what's Bang Bang Con? Hey, hi, Mirror by. It's an amazing <laughs> human being. I just I cannot comprehend how how it's possible to caption anything in life, especially like technical talks. The Bang Bang Con is a conference about uh, joy of computers. And I was so happy to be at the non-gaming conference, like for the first time in my life, maybe. <laughs> Wait, why are you so happy not to be at a why to be at a non-gaming conference? Oh, because people were genuinely curious and asking me the questions about the game and myself oh, cool. and my talk instead of like giving me their opinions about how my talk should have been and what I missed in my talk. Oh God, does that happen a lot at gaming conferences? Yes, yes. Sorry. especially with women. Yeah. That's really <laughs> annoying. I'm sorry. Um, well. Let's go ahead and talk about your work and your project that you just released very recently, Bizarre Barber. Let me change the scene over. Uh, so um, this is some gameplay footage. Um, tell us a little bit about Bizarre Barber and the concept and how you play it. So it's a game, it's set up on the subway stations uh, in the apocalyptic future and you play as a barber who uh, tries to help people to get rid of radiation by cutting their hair. And the people are not people, but they're basically like mutants. So it's a tale about a post-apocalyptic capitalist future, dystopian future. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So the present, where we're living now, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I forgot I brought a special prop. One of these, 
Aren't, aren't these cool? This is a vintage, very vintage Samsung Gear VR. Now discontinued, now totally useless, just some plastic <laughs> scrap now. But I'm just going to go ahead and wear it because I actually thought it was like pretty comfy. Yeah. I like the form factor on it. Yeah, I told my followers you were wearing a cute tiara today. So <laughs> nice. It's the tiara now. Um, so um, tell us a little bit more about some of the design behind Bizarre Barber and how it works. Yeah, so. Uh, there were some like design decisions that we deci decided to make, like no buttons and uh, change of scissors on the main mechanic. So you don't have to press any single button in the game. Uh, everything is like diegetic in the game. Mm -hmm. So you're changing the scissors and we also did this cute motion patterns uh, for, the, for any characters. So the combination of scissor change, speed change and the motion patterns actually gave us unlimited design opportunities. So we are good for like hundreds and hundreds of levels uh, because they're like have infinite combinations. Uh, but you don't have infinite levels. You, no, you've no, no, pre-made some yes, yes. handcrafted beautiful yeah. levels, right? Yeah, and so we made a generator for the characters, but we never made a generator for the levels because we very clearly realized that manual design is so much better. Mm -hmm. And humans like understand that. See, this is motion patterns uh, right now on the oh, screen. Cool, yeah. So they, they're moving like in a ping pong fashion. They're like turning around. And we also can set up like the hair positions and the hair length. And all of this combined together is actually pretty cool. So we can control like the intensity of the gameplay. We can make it relaxed or we can make it very, very intense. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's almost like, it's really interesting. The motion, it reminds me of like a shmup or something, you know? Yeah. Um, where it's like, there's like enemy patterns and stuff. It's cool to See, adapt to that. Like this. Except we're not like shooting <laughs> gun. It's not just like another zombie shooter, yeah. right? It's like uh, more like, expressive and creative like this, right? Yeah, and if we combine those motion patterns, it's actually, they look really great. So it's like, a, we kind of combine some birds, so then do like this, and people interpret this like differently, especially older people, not children. They're like, are they like screwing right now? Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Oh God, I didn't even have, you know, but, you know, maybe, maybe that's what we do in a post-apocalyptic future, right? Yeah. Uh, we just screw on the subway, you know, that's... <laughs> You know, New York subway, that's how it goes sometimes. Uh, so tell me more about this boss design. So this is actually anti-boss design. So while after the intense game, so you like get to cut the boss and players were asking for like something creative. So boss actually doesn't give you any penalties. So you cannot lose the boss, right? And the hair are regrowing on the boss. So you can be as creative as you want and you can relax and actually rest in between the levels. So that's the purpose of boss or anti-boss for that fashion. Cool. Well, yeah, I like I like that phrase anti boss. That's like a pretty cool. Like you should make that into a thing. Give like a GDC talk <laughs> on just what it means to make like an anti boss. Yeah, and they're also like uh, telling soothing poems, uh, ASMR like poems and songs. Um, are you so? Are you really into like? Being a hairdresser or bar, like, did you do research into? Did you get like immersed in like what it means to like cut hair and stuff? Uh, actually, yes. I even discovered that there are uh, speed hair, hair cutting competitions in US. So Wait, it's like a game? It's like a sport? Yeah, it's a sport. So people are doing this for speed and then uh, like jury sort of like estimates like kind of grades what, what was the haircut, was it good or not, and the time. Whoa. Yeah. That's really cool. Do um have like barbers or hairdressers or stylists giving you feedback on the game? Have they gotten a chance to play it? Uh, actually, yes, we even like had uh, an event in like an actual barber shop. We wanted to have an event in Los Angeles, yeah. And Wait, and you and you made it happen in a barber shop? Not yet, but we are like going into there. So okay. there's like a barber shops, and people are actually going there. It's like a community, you know, point of community. Oh, nice. Well, that's super cool. Yeah, I've never heard of playing games or like staging an arcade or event in like a barber shop. We that hope we can cool. make it happen soon. I mean, I think. E3 might be canceled, unfortunately. <laughs> and actually, you were supposed to uh, present at GDC, right? Yeah, yeah, I have three talks, actually. Approved. Oh my god, you had three talks? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, I had one talk, and I was just like, oh well, too bad, womp womp. But, oh my god, you had three... Um, do you want to give us a preview <laughs> of what those talks might have been? And then maybe we'll see some of that material come out of you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to be recording these talks anyway. So the oh, cool. one was for an um, experimental gameplay workshop. 
about the gameplay, basically what I told you just now. Uh, another one was for the tech toolbox, when I'm gonna be explaining how we generated like the character generator. So we thought like we can generate thousands of them, but then actually this process was so inefficient and curation of these characters was so inefficient and sad. So we just switched to the manual and we also invo <laughs> involved students into designing this generator, NYU students, like Game Center students, so they helped us to design the better tools. Oh, cool. Yeah, and the third talk was for Houdini launch. Uh, so we used Houdini extensively for the game, and we improved our like uh, iteration and pipeline with Houdini, and that is how Houdini can uh, help us to save some time on indie projects. Now Houdini is still like a pretty like new kind of emerging tool. I mean, it's getting more and more widespread in AAA especially, but I think indies don't really use Houdini much oh, yet. Oh no, you're, you're actually wrong. So really? India are using Houdini like more and more, and actually you can see the. Uh, Houdini used by like solo developers that are doing amazing work just because they can like do all this work with Houdini basically it's a powerhouse and they have a special indie license for just less less than like three hundred dollars you can buy the indie license who does everything as a oh it's perpetual three hundred just forever for indies yeah oh that's pretty good uh, and uh, yeah and they have like amazing evangelist for indie games Ben from Los Angeles who's helping a lot so they sponsored the game jam they have a special category for the game jam. And they're very like approachable and cool people. Do you want to recap what like Houdini does for people not familiar with Houdini, mm -hmm. and then like how you kind of used it on Bizarre Barber? So Houdini is a 3D modeling package, but not your like regular Maya. Houdini is uh, supposed to be for parametric modeling. Uh, that means you can design the whole systems to generate stuff and then quickly import it to the game. They have a plugin for Unity, so you can do it right in Unity, so it, not in real time in the editor, but you can do like fast iteration on level design or on modeling or other stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. So people are mostly using it for level design, but if you, so Houdini is really powerful, it supports Python. So you can write your own like micro nodes and micro tools in Houdini. So for example, we made a custom uh, character importer. So in Unity, when the characters come in from the generator, so in Unity we do this like whole wrap up. So we assign physics on them, colliders, uh, all the scripts, we generate the hair. We also do grooming in Houdini. So all the hair you see here were done in Houdini. Oh, we're exporting wow. like a points from Houdini uh, to the JSON file and Unity reads from them. Wow, so Houdini does a lot. A lot, yeah. Is, and, uh, is it the future? Yes, everything in the game that you see except the environment is made in Houdini. Wow. So wait, so how do you how do you get so this is a very different workflow yeah. in the history of 3D art, right? Usually yeah. 3D is something you like sculpt or you shape with like polygons and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But Houdini is like What's the metaphor here? We're not sculpting with like our hands. What are we doing instead? We're like So I'd say you're sculpting with the spreadsheets. You're sculpting with spreadsheets. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, wow. Houdini can leverage like the programming background from people. So if you think about the things in system or algorithmically, it's a really like it's a really big advantage. And you can also like sculpt and model us in a regular 2D program. You just don't have to. I we actually did move a single vertex for all these characters. It oh, was wow. all parametrically created. Yeah. Nice. Oh, camera died. It also kind of makes you think in other terms as a designer. So you think more about the underlying principles of everything, visual principles like silhouettes, shapes, and how it all goes together. So optimization is kind of at heart of this process already. Uh huh. Um, so you would recommend these, this tool, Houdini, for people who may not feel like artsy artists, but maybe they're like programmers or technologists. It's like a different way to enter into 3D art, right? Absolutely, yeah. And a lot of uh, people with only programming background actually got really good results in Houdini. Nice. Because you can be a curator, you can generate like thousands of characters for starters, and then you can select like the better, the best. So oh, so it's like a workflow. It's like a very different workflow, right? It's like... Yeah, you can do whatever, but a lot of people do that. Nice. Um, okay, but to Go back to your project mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, so tell us about what were some of the, oh God, the captions are still messed up. I'm sorry, I, oh God, okay, I'll fix them when we shift to the news segment. Um, so tell me more though about the design of this. Like, um, like what were, like what was your audience for this? And like, how would you compare what you've made to like other games that are out on VR? So we actually, we didn't know about the audience, weren't sure about that, and we just like uh, went to playtest and just like asked different people to try it, and we just noticed the reactions like, 
And like teenagers, kids and women have like the best reactions, especially like older women. Which oh, was okay. really nice and amazing, I think. But ultimately, all the people like the sound of like cutting hair in this process. And this is something you can do in real life, you mm -hmm. know, cut infinite hair. Uh, so yeah, and then we made the game pretty much like action-y. So like action games, lovers also like it. Um, yeah, it seems like it has like a very like wide appeal to like a lot of different audiences, right? Um, but you, you mentioned that uh, older women really like this, right? Yeah. That's really cool because older women aren't the traditional gamer, VR gamer audience, Absolutely, right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, why do you think that is? So first of all, they're better at the game, just better. You know why? Because so we have this like little screen over there with like efficiency and scores. So like gamer people, like men people, men folks, they usually like look at this screen all the time. So they lose the flow pretty quickly. Women don't care about the competitive aspect of the game or like beating someone else or beating your high score or winning the tournament. They're just in the flow. And we build this like motion pattern. So it would be like a little bit rhythmical. So if you are in the flow, you like win pretty quickly and it's effortless. And if you start to care about your scores, it became really hard to win. Right, so it's almost more kind of like a dance game a little bit, right? It's not a rhythm game, but it, there is like kind of underlying principles and rhythms. They're more about like body movement than music. Well, speaking of that, like maybe we can talk about some other VR games and what Absolutely, your take on yeah. them is, right? Like um, if you talk about rhythm games in VR, then that means we're probably talking about like Beat Saber yeah, at that point, right? What's your take on Beat Saber? Oh, I like Beat Saber. I mean, everyone likes Beat Saber. How can you not like Beat Saber? Well, I don't I felt, I've, <laughs> I've played it. I thought it was like a little bit, I don't know, dry. I, I like it. But for me, a lot of the appeal for me in VR was about like, going into this like world and stuff, right? That's why I really like the how like Bizarre Barber is almost like a beat saber that's about, <laughs> you know, like, you know, like visiting this place. But in like Beat Saber doesn't seem to be so much of a place as like a state of mind or something, right? I don't mm -hmm. know. I think it's it plays very cool on this like self reflection and self empowerment feeling when you feel like a god or like a superhuman when you just like smash those boxes. So the environment is not that important in this process because it's all like from the goes from the inside. Mm -hmm. It's your personal empowerment feeling. That's why Beat Saber is so popular. Um, tell me a little bit more. Uh, what are you playing in VR though? Like uh, what uh, what else are you playing in VR? What's what's hot right now? Uh, so then their clothes are doing like pretty great work with VR now, mm -hmm. uh, experimenting a lot. There's a lot of location-based stuff that is like uh, amazingly cool. Like a two-bit circus has like a multiple of VR uh, multiplayer installations with like physical props mm -hmm. and like a floor that is moving under you. So moving floor is a game changer for me for, for loca location-based. It eliminates motion sickness entirely. So you can fly wherever you want and be fully immersed and it's so fun uh, also like some cultural stuff is happening uh, so like 2d movies like not the movies but uh, experiences like passive experiences uh, some of them some of the recent ones are also great like ayahuasca by ian conan is amazing it's an amazing experience and it's entirely seated with just a little bit of the interactions so i'm getting sweaty i'm gonna put <laughs> this down now <laughs> uh okay yeah it's about uh, ayahuasca trip in peru Right, yeah, there's, there's been a lot of these like uh, VR like experiences, right? They're more about like very expressive, immersive 3D like around you and stuff, right? Um, is that still like going a lot? I felt like a lot of that was being pushed by like, you know, like uh, the great folks at like Viacom Next or uh, Oculus like Story Studio and stuff like that. Is that stuff still going or like are people moving to like some other idea of VR? So this stuff is going to be going uh, until the ITP is like kind of quits because all of the like the trailblazers in this field are from ITP actually or from oh, NYU. Really? Yeah. So like New York people are moving this field forward. Oh my God. Wow. Thank you for moving the field forward. <laughs> I, ju I just <laughs> went to this event yesterday for NYU alumni who uh -huh. are in VR. So all of them except me were ITP alumni. And they were doing like amazing work with documentaries and interactive uh, experimentation and other stuff. Wow, nice. Um, what what do you think is the future of 
VR and stuff, or XR in general, or oh, wait, okay, how do you feel about XR, the term XR, first of all? <sighs> It's hard. It's like doesn't make any sense. Uh, it's impossible to explain, but we are still using that for some reason. Why does why do you not why did you think uh, XR doesn't make sense? Because like extended reality, extended, X really? I thought X <laughs> just meant like anything. No, it it means extended reality. Oh, that's what people think. I thought X just meant like V or A or any letter. It no? should be like ER if it's extended reality, but ER then sounds, you know, like as an emergency room. Oh, yeah, that's kind of weird, right? We don't want to call it ER. That's no. <laughs> uh, or maybe we should. Um, okay, yeah. So yeah, maybe XR still has some kind of like brand issues we have to grow through. Um, but so, what do you think is the general VR, XR, AR, whatever landscape? Well, how's it going now? So the businesses are doing pretty pretty cool with like VR stuff, like training stuff, medical training especially. Like our own Langan in New York is using like extensively VR for like a cadaver dissection, for stroke rehab, for uh, meditation, for like um, doctors in between the sessions so they can rest. So it's already working. Oh, so there's a lot of interesting application of yeah. VR outside of games as yeah, well, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, and that's that's going and that's increasing. And all this like rumors about uh, like immense need of VR engineers and designers is actually like coming from there, from the business side. As for the game, so there are like a lot of experimentation right now uh, and a lot of wonderful initiatives such as SideQuest. Uh, which is like the road outside Oculus Wallet Garden. Everyone can post on side quest and then have the experiences on quest for free or for cheap experimental stuff. Uh, many studios were funded actually like last year, like very cool studios to experiment on VR and to work on VR projects. So the funding is still happening, although it's like pretty narrow window mm -hmm. for that. Uh, and people are generally seem exci exciting, but like Moderately exciting, not as like 2017 excited. What are you, are you excited? What are you excited about? I think after like a year and a half of development, I'm more realistic than excited. Uh, I know for sure, so like people can make a living doing VR. Uh, I probably even can't fund their own projects, but it's hard. But everything is hard though, so. <laughs> That's true, everything is hard. <laughs> um, in case you're just jo joining us, uh, I'm here with Maria and we're talking about the state of VR. Um, if you have any questions about VR or you want to get Maria's take on anything about VR design or game design or anything in general, uh, make sure you let us know in the chat. Oh, there actually is a question right here. Um, in the chat, Sam P asks um, or mentions more of a comment than a question okay. really. Uh, the VR money is drying up a bit. Would you agree with that? What's your take on that? The VR money is drying up a bit. I think it's just this market is coming to the like to the realistic situation. So with no hype, it seems like it's drying up, but the things actually are still happening. So we have our lab who is like uh, involving investors from different AR and VR backgrounds to work with New York businesses and fund them. Our lab is like the XR VR incubator thing going on at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Right? Yeah, it's a nonprofit, so it's not like entirely like an incubator. So they also do community building and workshops and lecture there, like working with Tendon on that. Mm -hmm. So there are like live people, investors who are, you know, going there and they have monies and they're like talk to people. So it's still happening, it's just not at the massive scale as everyone was thinking like two years ago. Right. Um, right. That's what you were saying, right? Like, realistic rather than like super hype mm -hmm. bubble stuff, yeah. right? Um, but I think that idea of like VR money is really interesting because um, like I'm I'm one of the people who was like being like, oh, VR money. I smell some <laughs> VR money. How do I get that VR money, right? <laughs> um, like a lot of the early um, like developer kits that I got for like the various schools I was teaching at were like free donated by VR companies to try to like jumpstart development and research at universities, right? Um, and now I feel like a lot of that generosity from like VR platforms and stuff is kind of, has kind of dried up a little bit, honestly. Like I wouldn't even know who to talk to at Valve to get like free Valve indexes for us, right? Um, so um, I don't know, what's your, what's your take on that? Like, do you think you need 
the support of like a big VR platformer company to like make it in VR or maybe that money dried up because it's not as necessary or important anymore? What's your take? So I think the bottleneck there with the support was not like that they didn't want to give up the headsets or like money or support they want. And I know that for sure because I'm working with develop, develop relationship teams at Oculus and on HTC. So the problem is that once they give it up, so there is no one, like, no one who can use it. Like, for example, libraries, schools, high schools, so they don't have any training programs or support pro programs for teachers. So sometimes they should have this pile of like expensive headsets that just don't know how to use them and don't have budget for games and stuff. So there is the bottleneck here and it can be solved and the companies are willing to, to support. And yes, of course, we need support of the hardware platforms and companies. We can't do anything without them. So it's almost like it's not necessarily like materials. It's about like training and yeah. like a culture at the institution. Yeah. Do they know how to use VR? General awareness, yeah. Sure. Um, oh, we have some more questions in the chat. Oh, the video cut out again. Um, Sampi also asks, uh, why do you think Oculus has a walled garden approach to the Oculus Quest? So because I guess that's because they're very cautious about uh, the general uh, situation around like VR perception. A lot of people like in the beginning of VR were really like motion sick and they hated VR and they never tried VR after. So Oculus tries to prevent this because there are still a lot of people around who never tried VR before. So Oculus want to ensure that they have the best experience. So everything is super tested, super polished. Uh, I personally think they will kind of like open it a little bit, you know, like in, in some like maybe a year or two. But for now, so they want everyone to experience like the best VR possible. They're like the well tested, the polished. And yeah, I personally think the curation is a little bit bland. Uh, <laughs> Too safe, maybe? Yeah, or? too safe, maybe. Uh, but this is like, a, you know, they're having different people in there, so they like having consensuses. So maybe once the team makeup will change, the games will also change. OK. Well, thank you so much for joining us and uh, us picking your brain about VR stuff. Um, oh, we shouldn't shake hands because of coronavirus. Yeah. Do you want to elbow touch? Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and um, if you want to check out uh, Maria's stuff, check out what bizarrebarber.com. Is that the website? Yeah. Okay, uh, check out bizarrebarber.com. Um, buy it, support your local indie VR developers. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. Bye. Uh, okay, let's uh, transition to our next segment. Our next segment is uh, called The Discourse with Naomi Clark and Frank Lance. So come on over, folks. Good. Thank right. you for practicing good greeting hygiene, Robert. <laughs> yeah, this is a the, um, We need to. It's true. You wash yeah, your hands. Don't, You're touch not... your, don't touch your face. Yeah. Well, here, there are two things you need to know about the coronavirus. Wash your hands and don't touch your face. Don't touch your face. <laughs> and it sounds like a joke, but it's really true. Wait, and do I get a microphone? No, um, just me. I, I will here. tell you guys you what take, is it Naomi is saying. Naomi is asking if it's sanitary to share microphones. Share microphones. Right. <laughs> oh, you want your you want to be able to speak for yourself? I was just going to tell people. No, what no, you, you can you can talk for me. I'll You're paraphrase it's really Naomi. Echoey, like last time for some reason, we might have to do the one. Robert, is can I ask a question? Is it okay if I eat on stream? Um, I think it's okay. Let's just give a content warning for people. Frank Lance is going to be eating. Chat, is it okay pizza. with you? I'll ask. I'll I'll um. I'll leave it up to chat to decide. Is it? Okay? I just haven't. Ha I'm having a terrible day. Yeah. It's, things are like jamming um, up. Frank, you are at the beginning of the risk group for coronavirus. So, so I, think I need we to, want keep you to keep my health up. Keep your health up and Thank you. uh, and eat. Um, <laughs> shout out to Bebe, my favorite uh, uh, Battlegrounds, uh, uh, Hearthstone Battlegrounds streamer, a charming young South Korean lad who mm -hmm. um, every day his mother brings him uh, food and he <laughs> tilts the camera down and shows. Uh, what a, a delicious well, home cooked uh, Korean giving, meal looks like. He should be like. giving props to his mother that way. Yeah, so exactly. Really so I'm gonna I'm gonna be like uh, Bebe and, and right, eat we're, my lunch. We're so. just demand for you to eat. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank from, you. From Sierra offline. Okay, I don't know thank who that you. is. Thank you. Thank you. Whoever that is, <laughs> yeah. I appreciate. Um, Shout out to where's, Sierra. Where are those offline. links? Let's get this up. All right. Uh, okay, so where there's the first link of today. All right, yeah, so uh, it was a slow news week, in part because all the news was taken up with coronavirus and Democratic primaries. Here's one overlap. Uh, this is, why am I spacing out on the name of this character? It's uh, Isabel, right? Isabel from Animal Crossing uh, apparently has endorsed uh, Bernie Sanders for president. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I think this is probably good use of video games. Uh, the news coverage of this tweet was like, we have to point out, uh, Isabel is not actually endorsing Bernie Sanders. <laughs> this is a fan video. Uh, which just shows this is a pretty well-made well fan video. <laughs> a lot of people had to have that yeah. pointed out to them. Also, uh, in gender debate, uh, with people saying things like, but uh, Isabel is such a nice girl character, why wouldn't she be voting for Elizabeth Warren? Wait, I, I'm just not even going to say anything more about that. <laughs> I think Warren just withdrew. Yeah, she did. Because of this, maybe. Yeah, maybe I think she was like, uh, even Isabel's not voting for me. Uh, and decided to Who's Tom Nook voting for? Tom Nook is voting for Bloomberg. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Even though Bloomberg dropped out. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. Tom Nook did early voting for <laughs> Bloomberg. <laughs> All right, let's continue on. A pass the Democratic primaries. Uh, okay, so, yeah, we have to mention this. GDC was canceled. Uh, a lot, it really affected a lot of people who had sunk costs in, in booths and things like that, or people who are uh, were nominated for awards at the IGF. Yeah. Uh, were a lot of people things people were looking forward to, yeah. uh, and so they there have, are some of these relief funds set up. Probably maybe people on stream want to know about this. Uh, there are a couple of relief funds that have been set up to try and help uh, people who are small businesses, individuals who spent a bunch of money recoup those funds from cancellations. Um, I don't know. Anything else to say? Uh, no, about I mean it's this? it's sad, but it's not that sad. I mean it's a prudent thing to do, and and it's smart that they did it. Yeah, and, it's not uh, not really a, we'll a be panic fine. reaction. I we'll don't be think. fine. We could all use a break from GDC. Yeah, uh, it, everything's going to be okay. Well, here's the interesting question: Is this going to shift everything more towards online over the next couple of years? Is everyone going to be like, "Well, do we need to get together in person?" Maybe we don't. I mean, I just came from a from a NYU chairs meeting where all the departments uh, yeah. get together and talk about what might happen if and when NYU uh, does shut down, and I was saying that in the world of games, it's already the case that a lot of studios and a lot of teams are working remotely, yeah, yeah. working from home. Uh, my son James has had a lot of experience mm -hmm. doing this. Um, these are small teams that are online together all day in right. some cases, so it really is a real studio and a studio vibe. Sure. There's people working from home. Yeah. I think this is the Again, way things are going. Sure. It, it, there, there are a bunch of people that being quarantined doesn't affect that much. Uh, right. Freelance writers, game developers. Yeah. Um, Tele people doing telemarketing in a freelance way, yeah. social media managers, uh, all Which can just is, stay I mean, at that's home like 90 eating of the workforce, cereal. You know? uh, well, yeah, and yeah. The, the people who are really hard to hit are going to be people in retail and food service and, yeah. uh, and uh, things like that. But but yeah, game game developers, it's almost business as usual. Yeah, games do kind of present, I mean, even if you think about our work process and mm -hmm. GitHub and um, remote, uh, the, the remote working tools right. that have developed around yeah, yeah. game it's, development. It's kind of, this is sort of an indication, I think, of where a lot yeah, of stuff is Yeah, because we're all shut-ins already. Yeah. Um, speaking of coronavirus, yeah, do you remember this game Fold It? Protein yeah. folding mm -hmm. game? Now apparently being used to try and fold proteins to, to see if a protein can be located, which could block the action of coronavirus on the respiratory system. Well, let's hope that it's effective. Uh, I mean, my take on Fold It has always been that th there's a there's a a good reading and a bad reading of Fold It in my right, mind. Okay. The, the the bad reading is that is the Jane McGonigal take. Sorry, shout out to Jane. You know, I love you, but the Jane McGonigal take that Fold It is an example of gamer intelligence. We're going to tap into the power <laughs> of mm. gamers to solve problems. Like take all that energy that gamers have and use it to solve problems. Right. My casual outsider read of what's happening and fold it is that these are um these are all uh biological scientists <laughs> that these are like phd students and people already like interested already in this field yeah. for the most part and there may be a handful of people for whom this is their first introduction to these topics sure. but for most cases um these are actually people who are already familiar already with and under, with it, yeah. yeah and this is like a, a playful context within which to do this what it what it really demonstrates is the power of alternatives to standard institutions right, of ac yeah. academia and and scientific research right these are this is a different way of structuring scientific research that is more playful it is more structured is it, it is, for them it's a form of labor perhaps to sort of go back to the word I, yeah. I do think that it, it ties into that but yeah. i think more so than that it really just demonstrates that we we've re kind of re right, jiggered right, the right. incentives for people to do this work and instead of like 
you know, instead of getting paid, so it is like play right. in a sense. But they, they, they have, they, they get to do it on their own terms. They get a kind of direct feedback, which is community right. based, which is their status, their esteem within a, a small community of people who care about this topic. Well, what's really interesting is that compared to those other tools, there is a sort of aura or halo around that core of users where other people can drop in and be like, oh, I want to try this. I want to see what it's like to fold proteins. Is boring. I want to go. Yeah, not it's not at all fun or interesting. It's not that fun, but you no. you can be like, okay, I'm I'm sort of twisting this thing. I sort of figured out how to do it. I I played it. No, what's fun and interesting yeah. is solving is curing diseases. That's right. With your and, friends. Right, and you're kind of you can dip your toe into that. Yeah. What this shows is the power of first of all, this is probably by framing it as a game. I believe that they probably made the best interface for, for doing yeah, this yeah. task. Right. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. step number one. It's just that games game design is really still pretty much the only um, profession yeah. of interaction design. It's, it's like <laughs> the leading edge of interaction yeah, design. Yeah, tackling some of the hardest problems, yeah. the so novel problems. In a yeah. sense, yeah, it's not that game design is about gamification and about, right. uh, you know, yeah, it's the, inverse the difference of between, um, in, you know, incentives that are um, intrinsic versus ex extrinsic incentives or reward structures. It's really about, oh, let's pay attention to the user experience. Let's make a good usable interface. Let's make it look good. Let's make it interesting right. and, and pleasant yeah, to use. Yeah, let's make it easy to learn. Let's, yeah. This all is this still is rare in huge. software. Yeah. And especially rare in like probably the world of healthcare, um, you know, yeah, you it's, know it's very large scale uh, industrial protein folding software. Yep. Mm -hmm. so, so there's probably that. Plus the idea that it is a community that you do get, you know, you get right. recognized for the work that you're doing immediately. You're not submitting a paper and then being told three right. months later and that you're not as allowed leisure to speak. as well. That's that certain probably makes a difference too. Yeah. Right. So I think this is actually just a version of science. This mm -hmm. isn't a, a video yeah, game. So, um, this is science. really just a kind of a, a playful and different uh, way of, of doing science. Right. So, so good. You know, thumbs up to that, but I, I, I kind of dislike the way it's framed as right, right. gamification. Oh, let's get yeah. gamers excited about helping yeah, to fight coronavirus. Yeah. All right, let's keep on going. Yeah. Um, okay, Hong Kong protest games. This is this is interesting, right? So we've been aware for a while. And we, we we talked uh, about detention last time, right? Mm. Um, and this time around, it's much more overt. Uh, games that are like literally taking place on the on streets like Argyle Street in Hong Kong, where a lot of these protests were happening, uh, and are encountering some problems on Steam. Uh, I guess a bunch of these games got up on Steam. They uh, encountered a lot of resistance from people sort of like spamming their pages with like anti Hong Kong protester comments. Yeah. Uh, now Steam is kind of like apparently, uh, according to these developers yeah. of one of these games, not responding as quickly to like when they need to update or fix bugs, their, their updates are not going up. Um, and maybe, yeah. and they're like, well, maybe Steam is freaked out by all of this, yeah. uh, all of the um, it would not surprise criticism me. being thrown our way. Yeah. I would be freaked out. Yeah, I wouldn't know a, what to do. It's, yeah, it's probably scary for right? Valve, honestly. If I was a, a guy who owned Steam and had a knife collection, <laughs> I, I would be I would be like confused and worried about how to handle this. Yeah, like the what do I do about China? I'm just goal, Gabe Newell. <laughs> the, the goal of protest culture is to cause problems. Right. So it's not like, oh my God, this is a problem. No, it's like, oh yeah, this is what the pr purpose right. of this kind of... It's um, a, yeah, to create uh, a situation where Gabe Newell is It's to create a, a disturbance yeah. And, yeah. And, and, to, and to question uh, business as usual and to call attention to the fact that there is... Um, that there's trouble. Right. And, uh, and so I think... And I think the, 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 there's a... This kind of plays into a thing in my mind which is really interesting, which is that Steam... Which in some ways looks like the heart of gamer norm core right. status quo yeah. is secretly um, has a ton of really weird, interesting subcultural energy. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's tons of people. It's so open. It's, yeah, and it's grown more open, even with green light fees and things like that. There it's are people. Like there, people can put lots of stuff. on People Steam. are making so much weird experimental art on Steam. Right. Postmodern, self-referential uh, stuff that is. In some cases, really smart. In some cases, really stupid. In some cases, you can't tell. It's actually like as interesting as you know net art or some yeah. other forms well, of like sophisticated. What was the thing that just was was surging in popularity last week? It was like a strip poker game, but it was Strip Connect Four. Mm -hmm. Did you see this, Robert? It was like that was the sort of sex game news on, on Steam that um, there was a Strip Connect Four game that was just taking off. <laughs> I think Robert's work is a good example yeah, of this. A very is. early um, creator that kind of like saw the potential of Steam, it's exciting. 
Yeah, the, and also um, free Hong Kong. I think Robert's right on chat that it doesn't really have anything to do with Valve. But here's the thing: so all of these games are available on itch. Itch is great, right? There's no problem getting these games on itch. And the story that's being written about in the press is about how it's there's problems on Steam. So it's like Steam is a point of friction because it is this very like used by everyone mass marketplace where there right. are there's there's tensions. That's and why it's important are, for them to be on Steam. It's that's the friction the is the good. The, the friction is the good part. The fact that it's easy to do on itch and it's there's no trouble getting it up on itch. It makes is the trouble with itch, right? Well, 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 <laughs> you, well, you on on one trouble. hand, thank God for itch. Right? Yeah. Otherwise, we couldn't get this game. Um, but then also, yeah, the, the site of conflict where, where things are actually happening is on Steam because it's so contested. Anyway, yeah, I, that, that's probably obvious. <laughs> and free Hong Kong. Yeah. Uh-oh, you said it on stream. What? No. <laughs> is that, I don't know, is that a controversial position? <laughs> to some people, surprisingly, yes. Uh, all right, let's keep going. Yeah, so let's talk about subscription models. We didn't really get to this last week. Uh, Stadia now is being criticized for, well, not having enough games. And apparently, according to this interviews by Business Insider, it's because Google was just uh, low-balling people and being like, we'll give you a small amount of money to develop for our new, incredibly difficult to develop for a cloud platform. And a lot of people were just like, no, why would we want to do that? I heard from some developers that I was talking to about, uh, about this that, yeah, they, the, Google expected people to just be excited by the tech. But think about it, like now you get to work with this tech, you get to develop for our servers, this is exciting, and game developers are like, no. <laughs> no, tech, technology is kind of in our way, usually. Yeah. It's not, game developers are not usually the people who are like, yeah. new tech, I just want to make anything for it. And yeah, so. <laughs> I have nothing to add to that, I think you summed it up nicely. Yeah, yeah so my, really my opinion on this is still, uh, Google is not really trying to make a serious play, it's all a trial balloon. Yeah, which is great, let them try things, it's sure. good to experiment. Why not? Um, it's just that, you know, I mean, I dozed off uh, just when I, as soon as I saw Stadia, yeah. I took a little nap. Go forward, go forward two links. I think we don't even need to talk about the next one. But this, the, here's, the, here's the business question, right? The, the Netflix of gaming, this overall subscription model thing. This was an interview, again, from Business Insider a, a couple weeks back, where uh, they're, they're interviewing large studios. And large studios are saying, oh, the subscription models, that's, that may be, really be a problem because they're paying a lot now to, like, or at least if you're not Google, some of these other places like Apple Arcade is the kind of the good example. Like they're like, oh yeah, let's pay some good prices to get um, to get users in the door, to sort of have have partnerships with premium content creators or whatever, right? Yeah. But then the fear from any mildly savvy business person is, yeah, that's going to be the initial period, and then they're going to start really lowballing everything once the subscription landscape has kind of taken over everything, because that's what Netflix did. Right, that's what uh, like all of the subscription models do is pay to get get people in the door, and then they sort of who's lower. Lo who's lo who's lowballing whom in Net Netflix? Netflix is low is now lowballing uh, TV and film creators. According. Oh no! I, oh I know. no! You mean really? Alex Garland is not getting <laughs> or whoever like oh right. No. Well, well, the reason we can make fun of that is because from our point of view, the budgets for those things are enormous and people are well paid. Yeah. How, although, but on the other hand, there, if you think about this happening to an in, indie developer, it's kind of not, maybe not. Net, a, Netflix right? should offer whatever they want to, <laughs> like, what? I don't understand the, everything's got to be like framed as a, as a moral, you know, position where there's some person doing so. Netflix is paying people to make TV shows. If they want to pay them less, right. Uh, then, then don't do it if it's not worth it well, to be paid. That's I don't where, know. That's this where this like, article. Like that's, the, that, that's where this article kind of ends up, right? Yeah, this, yeah. Well, they're talking to large studio executives, and they end up saying, "Look, we're just gonna, we're going to ha have to charge them more because we have to factor our margins in." But it, it's reconfiguring how everything works. They're not getting royalties anymore, right? It's like sure, the yeah. Factor that in, and then decide whether you want to be whether right. you want to take you know ten million dollars to to do a so, Netflix. So for us series. pundits on a stream, the question is like this is a reconfiguration of the of like the the logic, the way that sales work. Yeah. And what does that what does that mean? Is that oh, have negative side effects? Is it the same exactly the same? It, it it'll have negative side effects for some people sure. and for some deals, and it'll have positive uh, effects for other people right. and and for other kinds of ways of structuring your creative project and your business and who, how it gets paid for and how it gets out into the world. Ultimately, it's probably just a net positive for different people to be trying different things 
uh, discovering new ways of, of getting content to people and discovering and it'll benefit us. I, I just, I, I, yeah, I, I think trying you're, to you're scrutinize like, different different business like models, or, yeah. from a, especially from a moral perspective of sure. like, oh, let's let's sort these out into how good they are. I, I'm interested in looking at it from the point of control. Just, like, who's controlling who's controlling the information and the payouts and stuff like that, right? Like. There's always a problem with that with royalties, right? Like when my, you get you my get, guess is kind of no one. Kind, like it always yeah. looks from every individual perspective. It looks like the, the world is is conspiring against you, right? So if you are Alex Garland and you're making devs and you're doing a deal with Hulu or right. I don't even know what devs is on. I'm just obsessed with devs. Have you seen that show? <laughs> yes. It looks good, right? Is it going to be good? I'm not sure. It may, really is not it sure. going to be good? Like that statue of that girl? Anyway. Yeah. It's not Hulu. It's, it's like something. It's marketing. like hijinks or something. It's like a Dropbox it's, original. It's I don't what, know what it is. This is part. This is from the consumer point of view. Part of the issue. But but from his perspective, it's like, model. Oh, oh god, oh, these 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 uh, channels are conspiring against me. But if you're like a Netflix exec, you have the same kind of perspective. It's like, oh no, Hulu and and the, the you know Google are conspiring against me. Everyone is projecting a kind of paranoid image that the sure. that there are that there's this Foucauldian uh, structure that's well, just that's out there the imposing of, its its will on you. Sure, but that, that, that's what down. you're encouraged to do, right? You're like, oh, I got to not get screwed in this capitalist landscape. Yeah, but in most cases... Lane has a point in the chat. Oh, please, yeah. Lane. Uh, yeah, the yeah, centralization the, of power, sure. The centralization of power is... I think it's, it's about data right now. Uh, wait, go to the right. next story. Let's, let's look at the Apple Arcade situation. I mean, there are... The, the, the power is... Google, Facebook, Apple, Fang, and yeah, and um, Facebook, Apple, and, Amazon, and Netflix, Netflix, and Google. Fang. It's, it's, called, Netflix. it's called Fang. No, it's it's whatever. The, yeah. they're, they're like those big tech companies, <laughs> right. and, it's, and we are right to be concerned about the the, the level of power uh, that that is centralized within those. those right, four. and and those are lots um, of people who are trying to get into subscriptions. So Apple Arcade, here, really good example. Developers seem happy. Of course, they're happy right now because they got the initial funding. Yeah. Uh, and they're, they're all getting paychecks. Um, but it's not clear how or why they're getting paychecks, right? Like everyone I talk to about this, they're like, yeah, we got paid. We don't know how well our game is doing. I guess they're letting us stay. Yeah, uh, it's what's called a mixed bag. Right. Yeah. Right. You got <laughs> money for a game that was languishing. Let's be honest. A lot of those Apple Arcade games were games that friends of ours had on their shelves. Or they were, yeah, they're they were like, gonna we don't go. know how to finish this. We don't know how to. We can't afford it. It's is this going to work in the marketplace? Yeah, like in the if open we, if marketplace. We put it on Steam on it's the like App Store. A, yeah, it's like a nightmare survive? out there. Yeah. And Apple came in and 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 was like, did it offered a good deal to a lot of people yeah, to make absolutely. good games yeah. available to people at a really high level of quality. Right. So the fact that as part of that deal, um, they're they're trading off some other things. Sure, of course. Yeah. Of course. What do you expect? But it's interesting, right? That's the interesting part. Like, what what's being traded off, right? So, if you put a game out on Steam, like we know plenty of people who have, then you you get all of this data about like right. how well your game is performing. You understand like what's happening to your game. Right. With Apple Arcade, no idea. It's completely opaque. And then Apple is like. Your performance, audience performance metric was 87.2, right? Do you, do you have a game on Apple Arcade? No, I do not, but okay. I just know the number of people who do. I know a lot of do. people who do. Yeah, yeah. I don't and know so, what it's like. With their, yeah. Well, they, they, it's very opaque. It's like they don't know what's going on or what, how Apple is deciding which games to keep on the arcade or not. They're going to keep about 100, and they're going to push some out the door. And they don't, so nobody knows how long their game is going to be on there, uh, what, yeah. me, what it means to be doing well. Uh, like so, sure. this, actually, so when you're considering an Apple Arcade deal, yeah, that's part consider of the, that. Factor that in, yeah, and look at the deal. And you know what? Ninety nine percent of the time, you should probably, probably take still that good. deal. Right, sure. I think an Apple Arcade deal is a good deal. They give you a lot of money up front for for a thing that probably would make. Um, right. v less money uh, in in the nightmare right. b uh, jungle well, of, of the true open in, app store. Certainly true in round one. Yeah. I, th I think it's still going to be true for a little while if they bring more g new games in. They have to refresh it. Do you subscribe to Apple Arcade? I do. And are the, you going to cancel your subscription? I am not. I subscribed I in order I'm to play, them. you know, the games that my friends made. That's right. But the weird. So I that's played them. Not They're great. People. Shout out to my friends. Yeah. But and the new games that they're bringing I in, I, I think I don't. I don't reach for Apple Arcade when I when I go to play a game on my phone. I, I look know. and see what's coming in there, and I try the new things. Yeah, I so, have occasionally done that, and I've not been impressed. Yeah, the quality is not consistent, so I think good games can probably find purchase pretty easily in Apple Arcade for the time being. The interesting thing is Apple is not putting a huge amount of resources towards it. The other thing mentioned in this article, well, why are we showing Spell Tower for, for one thing? That's actually not on Apple Arcade, right? But um, 
the yeah, they're saying no, the. It's not. Why is it in this wow. Arc? Because Zach is wow. like, I would not put Spell Tower on Apple Arcade. Like he's he's not uh, putting Robert, all I of apologize his. apologize. <laughs> he's not putting all of his eggs harsh. into that basket. That um, was a little harsh. Yeah. So, <laughs> I'm sorry. I sorry. Sorry for the, no, the criticism. I, like, I love it. But um, <laughs> yeah. So what what was I actually trying to say? Yeah. So. I completely lost my there train was of thought. There was <laughs> Yeah, so they're wow. saying Apple is not really promoting uh, individual games or Apple Arcade that yeah. much, right? So it's sort of that's that's I don't also think lack of promotion being, is the problem. You don't uh, think so? No, I think it's just no, an attractive offering. I mean, it's fine. It's, it's a, a bunch of really high quality, you know, uh, games. But if they're not high quality, but it's sort of like I don't. I'm. That's just for me personally. I'm not looking for the. the, the there is a kind of aesthetic in Apple Arcade. Right. It is, I guess, I would call it maybe premium mediocre, to use to to paraphrase it's, Venkatesh it's, Rao. It's the feeling of Florence. Um, yeah, it, they're, <laughs> they're yeah, they're quality. They're executed at a high level, but they don't. I don't know. I mean, I like. Vid I mean, video games are garbage culture. I, I as as well as being art. Yeah, and, as and well Apple as being high culture. That. Apple has always yeah. hated that. Apple has always hated games. Yeah, this they, is the they kind of games you like get games. when people who hate games <laughs> decide, okay, let's use our tongs to like produce some games that let's hold they're our like, nose and give people, you know, some like, like we'll give you another fifty thousand dollars to Monument Valley the shit out of they're your shit. Yeah, they're they're very tasteful. <laughs> and again, apart from the games that our friends made, which I think are truly great, <laughs> they're awesome. <laughs> and uh, but uh, they have no, yeah, they just, have no. Oh, yeah, our friends' games have no edges sanded off them at all. Right? Rough <laughs> and artistic <laughs> and deep. And I'm touching um, my face right now. You please don't touch your face. <laughs> We're making Robert sweat. But but I, I no, I, I mean I do. There are some <coughs> exceptions. I mean, you know, I, I, I do love Dear Reader. Mutazione, I think, is, is really good. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Those are, are um, very good games. And, uh, and, but but I, I just, I don't think the idea of a darkness. little a, a little curated set of, like, very kind of uh, uh, middle of the road, middle brow, but very, you know, tasteful. Uh, yeah. Video games Pastel for your phone. Hued. That's not what the. That's not what the. That's not what video games on your phone are about. Well, maybe video games are in a period where it's fractured into a lot of different audiences, and that's whole one whole type of gamer, the pastel gamer. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> okay, let's keep going. Um, speaking of data, uh, this is a, a Mass Effect writer, uh, a former Mass Effect writer, was sort of complaining that um, oh, after Bioware. One. Uh, Drew Drew Kobarshin was like, yeah. "Look, all of their recent games are are just market research, and that's where their ideas come from." Is this from. the one where the like ninety seven percent of people choose the Paragon path? Well, let's go to that one. That's yeah. actually the next so, one. Let's 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 see, click. To sort the next of similar idea. I love the, this stat. Apparently, ninety seven percent of people who yeah, play scroll down on this. whatever Mass Effect or what what is this game? I guess it's Mass Effect. Right? I think. Well, oh, choose the choose the good. The, so there's these two paths. So you can right. play as Paragon or. We just, yeah, just, I, I just, just go to the, the Mass Effect Dirt bag. character, yeah. Yeah, right. it's Renegade and Paragon. Renegade, uh, yeah, right, this, there you go. This and article, 97% yeah. of people, this is a great example. Yeah. The, most video games are fake games, <laughs> right? It's a Potemkin village of, of choice. Right, you're you're shown this like this elaborate, you know, uh, charade, this this kind of theatrically present right. presented choice. Like you could, really aren't interesting choices, right? right? That's why speedrunning is cool because it sort of calls the bluff on video games. A lot of video games are like you're trying to get to the end as quick as you can, but you're not really. You're yeah. just having fun like a child in a playground. And when people actually try to get to the end as quickly as they can, it's like oh, it looks like this. Yeah, right? and it's like blowing it. Yeah, everything so, is which is clipping out and glitching in the which cameras is, everywhere. Which is fine. I know it sounds like I'm I'm contemptuous of this. Yeah, no, it I think like it's I'm good. scolding video games. I think that's that's just the reality of what video games are in many cases. I tried to convince Keith Bergen of this yesterday yeah. as I was playing tug of war with my six month old daughter yes and uh, and i was like look keith we're playing a game and i was like but really she thinks it's a ride this is <laughs> a brilliant insight and also this is why heavy rain despite being problematic in all the ways that it is has moments that are so brilliant the beginning of heavy rain where they're teaching you the combat system in a scene where you are playing uh fight you're play fighting with your kids in the backyard right. is so 
layered. It's such a deep self-reference to what games are, what video games are, the limits of rules and goals, yeah. and how they're always... Ro Robert loves the sequence in Heavy I... Rain, right? All the kid interactions? Yeah, and, yeah. You're, and you're playing, <laughs> and at a certain point, it's teaching you how to block, and then you're blocking, and if you keep blocking, you're like, you can't progress. Right. And you're like, well, well I'm, am I doing it wrong? Am I doing it wrong? No, you have to, like, like deliberately... You have to stop blocking because you're playing with a six-year-old. Right. Stop blocking. Let them hit you. Yeah, it's not and a it's like, real game. Oh, and, and it's such a beautiful moment. Um, and, and games are always like yeah, this. Yeah, like that is, let's just be honest, I, I, well, I hate David Cage in so many ways, but that's what he's good at. So true. And I'm not sure he knows he's good at that. No, no, he I don't think he knows he he's aware know. of it. Like the great he's unconsciously about, brilliant at that kind of thing. The great things about Detroit becoming human are the same way. They're like, wait a minute, who would ever do that? The way he puts the branching structure of the scene that you were just in. It's like, oh, let me show you the spreadsheet for the scene you were yeah, just in. Well, Here are the choices you could have made. It's like, why are you doing that? But it's so well, you brilliant. You can go back and do them if you want. Yeah, yeah but it's, 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 it's he true. kind of it's, breaks the story. He's saying, right. oh, no, he's this like, isn't a that real doesn't world. matter. No, yeah. the story is just a, a machine, just like you're just a machine. Right, right. Everything here is just a machine because we're all robots. robots. It's like, what? 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 It's, it's so weird. He doesn't know he's doing it, but he's, yeah, anyway. So the point of this Mass Effect story is, I think, that, yeah, yeah you're, you're presented, presented with, with good, you can be the, the good, good choice or the, or the, or the bad, bad choice. choice. Yeah. And like a bunch of people when they saw this, I, I saw a bunch of developers being like, oh, this is the nightmare of choice driven like branching games. I don't want to like write all this content that fought like 2% or 3% of the audience is going to see. And really, what happened in this case was Bioware just did a really crappy job writing and running a storyline. So wait a minute. So you're saying people knew beforehand that it wasn't good, and so they went down the other path? No, no, no. It's the, it's the inverse of that. Bioware knew, and writers, I think, knew semi-consciously, like, look, most people are going to choose the, ah, the Paragon story. So that's the real story. The renegade options, and I played as a renegade. The renegade options are, are all basically like, if you... Uh, if, you if you had, had Jonathan, Jonathan Frakes playing, playing Commander, Commander Riker, Riker, that's basically who this character is, right? right. But, but instead of, you know, acting like, like an upright Starship Commander, every time someone asks him something, he's like, No, fuck you! You like, Bleh! Right? And that's just how they wrote the Renegade, was just to have, like, just the... Just obnoxious? Yeah, just have the, char the same character, but, like, a little drunk and belligerent. There's also okay. So there's also a value to choices not taken, and I think we shouldn't sure. lose sight of this. That's right. That's there's, right. I remember the feeling of playing Morrowind. I think it was Morrowind, um, and walking by. I was walking on a quest, and I walked by a cave. I looked into the cave, and I realized, oh, there's a whole bunch of stuff in this cave, and I'm <laughs> never, ever ever going to see it. I'm never going to yeah. go into that cave. I know right now. And it filled me with a kind of weird pleasure yeah. to know this world felt more real because there were choices I had foregone. Sure. And so having too much stuff, it's part of the aesthetic right, of right, video right, games. Right. And it's part, of the, it's part of the labor the, of the making luxury them. luxury of having more stuff than you are going to consume. Um, yeah, is like part of I, the feeling of, of it's the feeling of, playing of buying a video game. an overly large bag of tortilla chips. Yeah, and being like I'm gonna get sick if I eat all of this. Yeah, it's a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so so there is some value there. Okay, on that we have to like okay go to, go to the very very last link, the, our our final link of the. This is my new thing. I'm gonna leave you with with one thing to think about, and yeah, that's, my tweet deck. that's your tweet deck. It's. The excellent gaming bed. There's your gaming bed for if you get quarantines. Just hold yourself up in that gaming bed. Shout out to the gaming bed. Yes. The end. Thank you guys very much. It's been the discourse. Wash your hands and don't touch your face. That's right. Um, thank you so much, Naomi and Frank, keep telling us what to think, as always. Um, well, that's the end of our show and broadcast for today. Unfortunately, we wish we could stay with you longer, but um, we've only hired our live captioner for an hour, so we don't want to keep taking free labor from them. So, um, so we're just, I'm just going to go ahead and end the show. Thank you so much for hanging out and listening to us and humoring us with your attention. Uh, let me cut to the credits. So I was your director host, Robert Yang. Uh, the person who found all the news is Naomi Clark. Uh, the graphic treatment was by Winnie Song, and captioning, the beautiful, wonderful live captions, are done by a human being, Mirror by Night of Steno Night Cart Services. 
Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And we will see you next week, I guess. All right. Bye.